The scales of conviction will illuminate the path we've chosen. The way forward is decided. We will stand by Roland. Bend the knee to High Zant and unify Norzelia. Boy oh boy does this ending suck. This was the last one I unlocked and for good reason. It was the path that went most against my convictions and reasoning. In this ending you have to convince your party that Roland's plan is the best way. His plan to renounce his kingship, Glenbrook, and the salt crystals to Hyzant in order for Hyzant and the goddess's teachings to rule over the land in a utilitarian utopia. The pain and suffering of the Roselle for a salty, plentiful life for the rest of Norzelia. We will submit to Hyzant and bring down Esfrost in accordance with their wishes. No. Pray, stop, and think about what you've chosen. You mean to endorse Hyzant's control and give them the world? I know well what this means. Forgive me. I beg you. This is how we will bring peace and equity to all Norzelia, Frederica. That is a lie, and you know it. Every moment of peace will come at the expense of Rosellen lives. What kind of equity is that? As many members of your party point out, Hyzant's mistreatment of the Roselle discredits their claims of equality. What a terrible, arrogant people. Their cursed souls dwell within you, their progeny, to this very day. Indeed, the proof is in the very color of your hair. The same red as the blood that flowed from their countless victims. But if you go against logic and decide to go with this plan, Frederica will fight you, literally, and then leave the party. Sarah Noah won't force her to go against her heart, which I think worked okay in terms of believability for his character. Bowing your head to Hyzant means you now have to face off against Esfrost and defeat Gustadolf. First though, Sikris must be defeated at Twinscape. An emotional goodbye is shown between Sikris' wife and kids, with us the player knowing that his family is about to be getting a little smaller. I... I must be going. Take good care of the children. Of course. Be safe, dear. Ah, you worry too much. I'm the constable of the great nation of Asfrost. Anyone who meets me on the field of battle will turn tail and run. <laughs> Good luck, Papa. Let's have your favorite stew when you get back, Papa. That is a wonderful idea. I look forward to it already. Come back soon, okay? Promise? I promise. You two be good now. Oh, <laughs> the game does an alright job humanizing Sikris with moments like this, but his blindness to Gustadolf's megalomania sits at odds with this depiction. The following battle is with Gustadolf within the walls of Esfrost. His ability to do massive damage to anyone on a frozen tile took me aback. You also in this and the last battle have Exam as a guest character charging headlong into battle in not the most intelligent way. He's a very strong fighter though, so I kept him alive with Gila's auto-revive ability to create success. I had Anna poison and backstab Gustadolf on the rooftops until he fell. When your resolve wavers, you will remember me and this moment. Fun battle, but not the last for this ending. Svarog blows up the place with the death snell, setting the last battle on what's left of the city as your party jumps from island to island of debris surrounded by molten lava. 
It's a suitably epic battlefield for Rowan and company to put the Death's Nail eh, into Svarog, who in my playthrough perched himself in the centermost area, daring my units to converge in the most dangerous point. The Roland route ends in the least effective emotional manipulation I've ever seen. Saranoa and Roland are back in Glenbrook, remarking on the positive changes in this Hyzantian governed world. Look at that beautiful goddess fountain in the square of Glenbrook. Two children pass by. They say, We would be sad that her parents are dead, but thank the goddess our bellies are so full of food and salt it was all worth it. Roland and Saranoa jerk each other off into the fountain about how their decision has made poverty and starvation a non-issue in Norzelia, whilst willfully ignoring any thought of the Rosels at the source. There's another scene that clues us into Frederica's final fate. She's shaved her head and is now a leader of a movement trying to disrupt Hyzant's false teachings. The townsperson who has seen her talks about her ideas as something no one in their right mind would believe, even though I can't imagine it's been more than a few years at most since the goddess's teachings have been taught to the Glenbrook people. Kind of a short time for a foreign religion to remove any doubt from this random NPC's mind, but hey, this is the worst ending after all. This ending could have been made much better if Saranoa was shown working from within the Hyzantian government to lessen the death grip on the Rosels. I think during the chapter 17 arguments, this is one point brought up as a potential, bringing change from within. He could still fail to do this, but it would go down easier for me than his blissful ignorance. The third best ending, Benedict's Root. This was the second ending I played through. If this wasn't a video game, this would have been my choice. It seems the most logical, and with Benedict, my favorite character, as its representative, how could this go wrong? In the infamous Chapter 17, Benedict details his plan to team up with Esfrost to take down Hyzant. Esfrost has the Death Snail to destroy the Goddess's shield. Without them as allies, we would be open to their attack if we went after Hyzant on our own. Makes perfect sense to me. Benedict is perhaps a little too harsh about the Rosels, saying something like, I don't care about the Rosels, because if we don't save ourselves, then what comes after doesn't matter. Put your mask on first during the turbulence before putting the mask on your child and all that. Roland is so offended at the thought of joining up with the S. Frosties because they killed his brother and father that he leaves the party. This shows Roland's hypocrisy, which is pointed out in other roots. If you join Hyzant in order to bring equality to all Norzelia, that means S. Frost as well. So if Roland truly believes in this equality, he shouldn't care about what side the equality comes from. But as we see in this scenario, if equality comes from partnering with Esfrost, then Roland's grudges become all too clear. You could argue that Roland doesn't believe Esfrost's system of freedom can bring true equality to the land and that Glenbrook, after their dalliance with this same freedom, is incapable of equality as well. I would argue that Roland is afraid of ruling and prefers to put the reins of Norzelia in the hands of a god, real or not, legitimized by generations of tradition. The first battle in this route is with Claris. He's head of the consortium, but I don't feel as if I interacted with him enough during any of my playthroughs for his presence to have any weight in any of these endings. Perhaps this is because he is used in such different ways in the other endings, or perhaps the few story branches I didn't take would have led me to a cutscene with more Claris character development. Alas, the battle with Claris is interesting in so much as the battlefield is almost completely flat, and more about the use tactically of the Cheval de Frise, aka the wooden spiky obstacles. He has some OP abilities that hit hard, but totes obvi we remove the head of the consortium. The next battle against Exham takes place on a similar battlefield with another retinue of cavalry. His temptation abilities are dangerous and he's a strong boy, but his pride is broken eventually. <sighs> Fight's not over. If I'm not dead. 
Face me if you dare, Sarah Noah Wolfort. Our battle is done, Minister Exham. Surely you understand that. <laughs> Have I lost my touch? Strength and wit ought both have been on my side. He's one of the more interesting characters in the game because his flaw has him on the same path as Sarah Noah, but for prideful reasons. Unlike the other evil saints, Exham's goals are lofty and noble as opposed to N's myopic greed. His positive attributes had me hoping that he would be unlockable as a playable character, but unfortunately his ego precluded his survival. The final battle in this route pits us against the mysterious Hierophant. Finally, a peek behind the curtain. Turns out the Hierophant was an automaton. Thou shall not worship false idols much. Edor believed an undying god robot was a better choice than looking up to fickle humans. Can't argue with that. This is where the game finally dabbles with Final Fantasy Tactics demon-like abominations, and I'm all for it. The Holy One's ability to zap anyone with too much DP for massive damage put a damper on my plans to cheese the boss. I love when a game anticipates the player's exploitations of its systems and slaps them at the very end for it. Oh, you thought you could sit there and power up. Nah. Also, the way this game rewards the player with interesting story details in each ending is appreciated, as in the Hierophant's reveal. The Benedict Group ends with Sarah Noah, revealing his royal heritage and ruling over Norzelia with Benedict smirking at his side like a successful Littlefinger. A cycle of inequality and strife continues in Norzelia for some reason that isn't believably conveyed for my tastes. Again, the downside of a game with any direction is that the directions have to be limited. There can only be so many choices the game designers let you play with or it will become unmanageable too vast a set of variables to be programmed in a lifetime. So much as I would love the ability to have Sarah Noah make smaller decisions after he comes into power, like making sure the Roselle are integrated back into greater Norzellian society, and for him to install Julio as salt maester so salt crystals are distributed fair and equally throughout the land, I am not given these choices. You've just knocked one out, right? You're lying there, you're feeling cheap, and deflated. There's a pool of rapidly cooling spunk on your stomach. You're looking around for something to mop up with. Oh, hello, what's this? The second best ending, and the first one I got, was Fredericus. This one is almost tied with the golden root as my favorite. Even though I'm not in love with Frederica, we aren't even married yet, I agreed with her arguments more than the other two. Another layer to why I love this root so much is that I lost Benedict. Me, Benedict. Benedict, my favorite character in this game. I beg you to reconsider. If you mean to proceed with this folly, then you will do so over my dead body. <laughs> when he tried to bludgeon sense into Sarah Noah, and I realized I was going to lose him if I went this way, I put the controller down for 30 minutes. Was it worth it to follow my ideals and lose Benedict? No other decision in the game made me as conflicted as this one. No other choice hurt as much. The stakes were well done, in this case. Ooh. In this route, you forego as Frosty Aid and sneak into Hyzant to incite the Roselle to rebel against their captors. This plan is based on making a pilgrimage to Centralia, a mythical land where the Roselle can be free and we can start a new nation unfettered by Norzelia. Claris shows up in this route to help us infiltrate Hyzant. We barely make it in and then face off against Lila. This battle is a little disappointing because it's a place I had already fought at earlier in my first playthrough. After dealing with Lila, we find ourselves in the source. In order to inflame the Roselle, Camsel must be overthrown. He's also a strong boy. His big AoE attack is intimidating with its massive range and damage. Using the salt or water area to your advantage with lightning is key. With Camsel dead, we successfully ignite the fury of the Roselles and make our way to Centralia. Edor tracks us down with his automaton horse brigade. That is as far as you go. 
Hidor? Impossible! How did you catch up to us? <laughs> Nothing is impossible for one blessed by the goddess. The horse. The least imposing of all the final boss encounters, but the safeguarding Roselle prospect adds depth to the strategy. It's the most idealistic ending, but this is a video game. And why not choose here the ideals that would suffocate and wither in reality? Minister Edor runs after you and kamikazes himself to keep you from the promised land. Serano Serenoa then makes the noble sacrifice to let the rest of the refugees escape. Tragic ending, but the one my heart went naturally on the first playthrough. The best ending, and the most obvious, is the golden route. No shock here. If you fulfill the correct plot points, then instead of consulting the scales of conviction, Saranoa says the words that every player has been saying during every major decision in the game. There must be another way. As mentioned before, it is understandable why the game couldn't accommodate a million different subtle choices, but it's great that in this moment, if you've done those certain things that Saranoa can throw off the shackles of the scales of conviction and convention and take all the little intelligent pieces from each plan and form the ultimate plan. Not only is this the most intricate, tricky, and difficult plan, it is also the one that ties up the most loose ends. With the challenge come serious payoffs. Hope you've been leveling up your other units because we're about to split them into three groups that you're now committed to. This is my favorite aspect of the Golden Root. There's a suspension of disbelief when you don't send out all of your units in previous battles. What are the other party members doing? Are they sleeping? Fighting another battle on a separate front? Now the game takes full use of all the party members you've recruited on the way and every single unit feels essential. I was missing two units that I would have had to play through the game two more times to completion to get, but after mental mock battling my units to level 50, I was prepared. Even just looking at the three teams split up and switching them back and forth playing out scenarios in my mind was exhilarating. This is what I want for more tactical RPGs, meaningful choices and commitments. I've got Gila on this team, so healing is no problem, but now I'm lacking healing on my other teams. Narv can kind of heal, but he needs more TP than Gila, so maybe Julio would help with that. It's high level tactics time, baby. The first battle is with Benedict against Exam, and just like my first fight against Adelora, I was determined not to use any of the Hawk statues to prove I am a tactical role playing god and I did it, with my favorite combo of cheapness, Quahog and Decimal. A challenging battle even with my stop time combo. After his defeat, Exam turned tail after saying something petty. Roland's team was dispatched to Twinsgate to kill Gustadolf. Archers make this fight laughable. A little overconfidence had me lose Roland in this battle, which hurt from an RP perspective, but I also don't like Roland. He's too squishy. Frederica takes on Camsel at the source. I had already done this battle in the Frederica playthrough, though without the use of my comfortable team I had more worries. This was the first time I got to use Evlora, and with her and Gila, my girl power team did a clam slam on Camsel's face. With those three battles done, I have my full roster back. At this point it becomes too easy again. A repeat fight with Exam that is almost the exact same as the one from the penultimate Benedict Root fight. With Avlora, Decimal, and Quahog, I barely even take damage. Then into the city of Hyzant, Lila is ready to brawl. If you deploy Quahog and land a hit, you get some additional dialogue. I was hoping for more, but anyone paying attention to the character stories will have figured out their relation by now. Another easy fight.
more puppets? They are innumerable. The last battle of the Golden Road is exactly what I was hoping. Very Final Fantasy Tactics reminiscent. Edor becomes a giant final boss unit. Even with my best units, I was worried at the beginning. Mega Edor can summon what was the final boss in the Benedict Route every couple of turns, and any reproduced Holy One automaton can create more of the puppet explodey units. Edor can go twice like Anna, and produces a one-hit invulnerability shell each turn. I got tired of tiptoeing, and after clearing enough of the puppets, went in with my full party and spit-roasted Edor with Avlora and Maxwell in a legendary combo. So satisfying. Why, my divine rule was to last forevermore. Check the tape. Was it them or Sarah Noah? I don't remember. Challenging the player, full roster utilization, and thorough story payoffs. These are the reasons this is my favorite ending. You lose the least and gain the most. Sarah Noah and Frederica walk down the aisle. Norzelia is finally united. What was your favorite ending? And why am I wrong? If you like the Roland Heizand plan the best, please explain why you have bad taste. Was it annoying me talking in my worst Benedict impression? To anyone who has only played through the game once, I would highly recommend another playthrough. I thought it was a pretty good game after my first playthrough, but after playing through New Game Plus, it's in my top 5 TRPGs of all time. The increase in challenge and the new characters you unlock introduce so much to the game that I almost consider the first run a warm-up. When you have Quahog and Decimal, the game changes dramatically. Figuring out ways to use Quahog's time stop ability in tandem with characters that gain TP and health from waiting in place gave me a tactical stiffy. And Evlora. Speaking of stiffies, I almost want to do a whole nother run now that I have Evlora. I prayed at the beginning of the game that she was playable and assumed no. But yes, she is, and God is she glorious. If there's a sequel, where do you see it going? Centralia? Sugar Steel War? Wherever it goes, I'll be there. <laughs>